My name is Tim McCarthy and I'm the director of the Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights program here at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And it's wonderful to have Karen Chase here with us tonight to do a reading from her book, which I will showcase here, uh, which is called Jamali Kamali, A Tale of Passion in Mughal India. And I would like to uh, mention that uh, uh, despite the fact that this is probably a little subversive. We do have books for you to look at and perhaps even contemplate purchasing uh, for Karen to sign after the, after the reading tonight. We have uh, our good friends from the Harvard Coop who are here. Thank you very much. Uh, but let me first uh, introduce Karen. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do this evening. Uh, I'm going to give a short introduction here, and then I'm going to uh, give the microphone over to Karen, who's going to do a reading and set some context, and then read from certain parts of the of the book and poem. And then I will ask a couple of questions afterwards, some follow-up questions that I'm sort of burning to ask. And then I will open it up, and we'll have a conversation with her about her work and uh, all of the different dimensions that uh, this work raises. Um, Karen Chase is a, uh, her poems and short stories and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The New Republic, The Gettysburg Review, and Southwest Review, among others. Uh, her book of poems, Kashmir's Square, was shortlisted by Forward Magazine as the best indie poetry book of 2000. Land of Stone, her nonfiction book about her work as a poet in residence at a psychiatric hospital, won a bronze medal in the Independent Publishers Book Award. Bear, her second collection of poems, was released in 2008, and her book-length homoerotic poem, Jamali Kamali, A Tale of Passion in Mughal India, was released in 2011. Polio Boulevard, which is a memoir, will be forthcoming from SUNY University Press in 2014. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. I've got a good reaction about the forthcoming memoir as well. Uh, her work has been widely anthologized, including poems in the Norton Introduction to Poetry and Billy Collins' Poetry 180. Among her honors, she has been a fellow at the McDowell Colony, of the Sanskriti Foundation at the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center in Italy. She has been the recipient of numerous grants, uh, several, uh, including several from the Winter, the Winter Biner Foundation for Poetry and the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, she lives in western Massachusetts with her husband, the painter uh, Paul Gravard. I should say uh, that at a school of public policy and a center for human rights, it's not often uh, the case that we have poets and writers and other kinds of artists, creative artists, uh, here at this school. And I think that's actually a great shame. And so one of the things that I have tried to do in my role as the director of the Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights Program, but also as someone who is a humanist, who's trained in history and literature uh, and these kinds of uh, more creative uh, arts and enterprises, uh, try to bring artists and creative people and humanists to the Carr Center to try to put a little bit more of the human in human rights than we sometimes get when we talk only about politics and policy. So it is my great pleasure to introduce and to welcome Karen Chase. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And thank you, Car Center, for having um, artists and writers here. It's an honor. I'm going to try without the microphone. Can you all hear me? Jamali was a popular 16th century Sufi poet who lived in Delhi. And no one knows who Kamali was. But according to Delhi's long-standing oral tradition, Kamali was Jamali's lover. Their story has never been written down. The minuscule number of facts known about Jamali, where he traveled, the Mughal emperors he befriended, and the fact that he was killed in battle in Gujarat are included in my book. But the poem itself is pure fiction. Thoughts of love, sex, separation, and death 
drove me toward the imagined story. From the time I began writing it, until nearly two years later when I was done, I was compelled to let these characters have their say on the page. Many people have asked me, why did you, of all people, write this book? I don't really know. I'm not a man. I'm not gay. I'm not Indian. I'm not Muslim. I'm not a Mughal scholar. I'm not an art historian. I'm a straight, white, American, Jewish, 21st century woman. I've crossed many lines here. Time, hemisphere, religion, culture, gender. Here's how it happened. Actually, to be honest, I didn't even want to go to India. My <laughs> husband, Paul, had applied for a, an art residency at a place called the Sanskriti Foundation in Delhi. And I didn't want to go, but when he got in, I changed my mind and applied and ended up going. One morning, this was 2004, one morning, about a week after we arrived, I hadn't written a word of the first week. The Sanskriti residents were told that later that day we'd have a chance to visit a newly restored archaeological site, the Jamali Kamali Mosque and Tomb. It had been in the process of restoration for seven years. The conservator of the restoration was going to guide us on the site. So we all troop into this bus. We go to the park. It's an overgrown park. We traipse alongside a river. I and mean, there's garbage all in the river. I had never seen such a site. Um, we climb through old ruins that hadn't been restored up and up a hill through bushes and brush and we get to a plateau and there's this small mosque and tomb that is so beautiful i mean it was just stunning to go to approach it the way we did and then to be there on this plateau A brand new sign that had been put up the week before was in front of the, the site, and it said, Jamali is a 16th century Sufi court poet and saint, and Kamali's identity is unknown. Mm -hmm. Then we're taken into the tomb, and the tomb is tiny. It's like, it's like an eighth the size of this room. It's just tiny, with two beautiful white marble graves side by side. And he says, this is Jamali's grave. He was a 16th century Sufi court poet. And this is Kamali's grave, his homosexual lover. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? You just put up a new sign saying one thing, and now you're telling us something else. Apparently, you know something, and why isn't it on the sign? And he said, well, nobody really knows. Nobody really knows who Kamali was. It's just a story that's been passed down for 500 years. Um, I was so fractured by that moment, the, the disjuncture of the sign and then what he said, that I went back to my desk at Sanskrit. I was there for three more weeks and I started writing and I wrote for two more years 
until it was a book. I had no intention of writing this. I had no plan. Um, I didn't know what it was going to even end up being. Um, but after the, after the first, um, after three weeks there, I did have a draft of the first section. And now I'm going to read from the first section. It's in four parts. So this is from part one. Can you hear fine back there? In the plump dusk, I hear a peacock screech. I marks on my lover's neck. Kamali, let's go to the lake to moisten our love scars. I will wash mud from your muscled legs. My secrets rest in the wedding hut. I visit another man as the moon circles down. Come, my protege, my Kamali, to bed. I will show you moves of a new planet as no astrologer could. Bonfires blaze in Delhi's winter. While dogs howl, I remove your kurta, your trousers, to teach you pyrotechnics. I am not called Professor of Fire for naught. <laughs> the donkey is caught between two worlds, as am I, as are you. Last night I dreamt of two princes at play. Vehicles passing both ways will praise our marble tomb. Bonfires burn on every street. One day I will startle you, circle you as you huddle for warmth to show all our attachment. When you watch me dance with the marigold-clad beauty of our town, do not grieve, my boy. It is you I am picturing. It is you who will be buried with me in twin marble graves high on the hill. It will be too late for any to object. Let them say what they will, and for centuries if they want. Molly, you anger me. Go. The men will give you a broom. Sweep the sagwan leaves from my courtyard. Join the room, boys. Your moaning is of no use. Take heed. I have my eye on the young mason, his onyx eyes. His lengthy fingers will do me good. I shall shatter the tiles of heaven to illustrate how you peeve me. A pile of red and blue shards. My love for you and hate are large. One day I consume you, the next regurgitate. And you, you seem to waver as well. Nights filled with massive thunderbolts. Dreams of rival women and men, violet sky, blue doors, green on the girl's attire, all praise Delhi's colors. Your love moves pale the palette. In the humid fields, our all odd audience, a tiger here, a squirrel there, Cheetahs, too, appear curious, 
You say, Kamali, you dreamt of bolts of velvet, carmine clothes for us both. Does this portend good luck? Who is the peacock here? One day you are, then me. I love our shifting plumage also, how the pea fowl guard us from intruders. What happened? Like a serpent eagle attacked, I am featherless. Your fierceness, Kamali, is catastrophic. Your smooth, royal fingers, your Raja-like stance, bore me. Seasons aiding the goat herd, your practice milking hands, your humbleness I love. Tonight, you must do as I say, dress as my bride. I will walk through Delhi streets with you unafraid. <coughs> then I will regale you with rubies, camphor, aloe wood will perfume our tent. No amount of liquor could make us so drunk. I promise. Now I can talk a little. Throughout the whole time, I was in constant email contact with a Persian scholar from York, England, who Sanskriti had put me in touch with. And he answered, I, I mean, I had questions every day while I was working on it, because although the story of the men was completely fictional, I wanted the details to be absolutely accurate. So I remember one day, I thought that, I thought that Jamali smelled apples <coughs> in Kamali's breath. But like, were there apples in Delhi? And I was Googling it out, and there were apples in Delhi then. But it was that kind of thing, like every detail had to perfectly reflect what Delhi was like then, and this guy was amazing. Um, and, then, and then the book came out two years ago, um, two winters ago, in India, and I went there and there was a, I went there to speak at the Jaipur Literary Festival, which some of you know is your, you know, it's, the, it's called the Woodstock of Literary Festivals. There were like hundreds of thousands of people and writers from all over the world and amazing music and flags and banners and food and drink and it's just, it's really incredible. But that was fun, but the most interesting thing was this book launch in Delhi and it was a room, a room like this, there were maybe 40 people and the man who introduced me had it in for me, which was really an amazing thing because it wasn't his job to get me trouble. But Just you wait. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm very nice. I mean, he just ripped into me for taking oh my two God. real characters and daring to write 
write about them. And it was it was really one of the most fun events I had ever <laughs> I ripped into him. <laughs> and you know, I talked about the imagination, like the imagination's a pretty good thing. Wow. So um <laughs> So, uh, I think I'm going to read from later in the book now. So there are four sections, and each section starts with a tiny little prose thing that actually are fact. They're factual, those little prose things. So part two, I'll just read you the prose thing. Throughout the reigns of Sikandar Lodi, Babur, and Humayun, Jamali's travels take him to Syria, Iran, Baghdad, Ceylon, Mecca, Herat, Damascus, Palestine, and Spain, making for many separations. And it's amazing at that time that he traveled. And this is the beginning of part three. Jamali reminisces to Kamali about the time when he had returned from a hunt and battle in Miwat, where he had been sent by the Mughal king, Babur. The sand blew so hard, remember? He had to take cover. How close was the lion, you asked? Take off your turban, I said. Outside, torn roses blew past. Butterflies scattered. Remember how the roof tile shook with pleasure? How close was the lion, you asked again. My mind roamed to that long ago dusk. A smoky-eyed boy pulled his boat down the Indus. Later, camped in a tent, I slept unclothed, alone. Through the night, I rode a black leopard's lean back, my privates a buzz in the oleander air. The lion was close, I said. Battle blood from the day before, a tender boy bled from an arrow strike. I covered him in my kurta as he died. Sickened, I rode into the overlit noon, came on a field of riderless elephants, crazed from gun sound. Their soldiers trampled, common death everywhere I looked. Before this, I was sick for you, and home, too, now, nothing at all. I taste apple on your mouth, Kamali. Smell wheat on your chest. You have been threshing. Winds of the earth fatigue and seas find rest. The sad bloody hunts of war and beast recede. The lion was so close, I felt his unusual breath. From all sides we stabbed the beast. I saw the lion's heart, his and the soldier boys, the same. Furrows, oracles, vena cavas, twists, turns, astounding aortas. After this, how to find life again? Kamali, love equals life as man's and lion's hearts do. I knew then you are my life, my love, my lion, my wife. My long song comes as sand drops down the hourglass. Lion, I call you lion. 
your eyes for one, your glowering, sun-drenched torso, your muscle, thighs, bronze, arms. When you stretch your arms towards me, throw your garments to the floor, recline on plush cushions, lay down your sword, wait, gaze, and wait, time done with, no battle, nor woods, nor outdoors at all. Yesterday the hour sounded, lion. Sand descended. How many years now me and my wild night lion moan, listen, growl? Who says there's no time in the fiendish fog? No wolf, no color, no cat. And here comes nothing like a man. A dervish? How mistaken one could be. A man, a lion, a woman. Before Babur, before <coughs> one long winter ago, Sultan Sikandar, the ruler, himself a poet and poet lover, crowned me poet of the court. When he died, Lodi, his son, had many of his father's men killed off. I feared death then, or jail. Snows outside threaten now, and fear returns. Inside with you, Kamali, coals, rooms with beds swell to world size. As you sleep, I guard your limbs, your chest's heat, fur of my prized lion. I am yours as dervish or saint in sickness and health. I am yours in battle or in the thick forest of the hunt. Out where the hunt happens, men converge around the lion, maul the thing. Cold light could strike. Thunder approach, and no thing would dampen the kill. Threat of hunt, threat of battle, threat of some lockup. I have lost sight of nature, and danger lurks over every hill. Jamali has gone west to Gujarat with Humayun and other war warriors to conquer territory. So this is Jamali. This is Kamali. Through the difficult air, Jamali, I speak to you from afar. Months have passed. Still, it is you on the paths, in the fields. Your face I crave. The shine of your black eyes pulls me by heat, so fractious and deep, I can't stand straight. Rattled birds dart and hit the frantic air. I keep seeing a man's face on the path near the bamboo grove, hollow cheeks, taut, barefoot in the branch, the heart at last, wordless Jamali, do not ask, sadness soaks me, meager speech, blankness, rash. In this thicket, dragonfly, take heed. Your face, sweet beauty scar, a light. Jamali, your face. I'm speechless. 
No. Your eyes are deep. No. Words land loud on the persimmon tree. Mouth, hip, I cower. Words blow like wind. I cower, Jamali. I'm chopping wood. I'm going to chop saplings. I taught you weather, Jamali, and fog. I taught you <coughs> great bear in the sky. Monsoon, words you thought you knew, I made fresh, then you left. Birds sang single notes. You have roared too much, my professor of peafowl, my guide through the palace of pleasure. Arch, bridge, corridor. Banners swelling light as we love beneath. Your must come. I need to smell your chest. I can't say, Jamali, remember to fuel our loving. Once I told you of the slight crease below one lover's waist. How from his navel to his genitals, soft hair made arrows. Remember the costume boy, cheeks a rush of rose, and lie, how fiendishly he danced to the lutes, his feet never still. I took him to bed, found he was a girl. And remember, Jamali, that bristly old man scratching his buttocks, squatting on the terrace, slurping his doll. He looked up so kindly, my heart pumped sugar. You said, Kamali, will we reach this luster? Soon after you mounted your war-adorned elephant, raised a red triangle flag and disappeared. What follows is Jamali's death and Kamali's lamentation. Right. So right. that's so 
was to say yeah. that. But, um, you know, I also think that that in the year before, before I went to India, that I became very close friends with three gay guys. But really close. You know, so that I, I, I think that I felt really um, a lot about the struggle. And I could never have written anything political. You know, I would never have. I just think that sparked this. I, I think it sparked it. I think knowing these guys had a huge effect. <coughs> um, and... And to me, this book is really, it's a universal love story. It doesn't matter who the people are. They're just two people who love each other. And um, so I think that, that was a huge spur in it, that I can write about that because it interests me. And, it, and going into this whole other realm, just was so fertile. I don't know if that answers. Yeah, no. It, <clears throat> I guess what what's at um, at the core of my question is, I think a, a a larger question about the risks that you're taking here. <clears throat> risks that open you up for criticism, which was something you yeah. experienced when you went to the the, the Woodstock of of, 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 of uh, writers uh, convenings. And also risks that have an enormous payoff, right? When you take a risk to cross bridges or boundaries that exist, that are real, um, it does potentially pay off in opening up new ways of understanding, new ways of empathizing, new ways of connecting, and so forth. And so I'm wondering how you, if you were aware of those risks when you went into it, right? When you, when you went to India, when you went to the mosque and tomb, when you began to think about potentially writing this poem, were you aware of the risks that would pay off imaginatively, or also the risks that also would come back to perhaps haunt you in terms of some of the criticisms that you received? Absolutely not. I had no sense. I didn't, all I knew is that I had to keep writing there. It's that they were speaking. That's all I knew. And I, and I didn't know anything else, and I didn't really care about anything else. Um, what came after, I mean, that it actually was a finished book, and actually didn't end up in my drawer for the rest of my life, was just sort of a miracle to me. Um, but, you know, particularly in India, the gay community just really taken to this book. You know, very much so. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. But, but first I wanted to ask you a question about history. I'm a historian, and I promised you I would not ask you. Uh, Karen and I talked on the phone the other day, and Karen said, now I'm not a historian, so don't ask me any questions about the history. But one of the, I am going to ask you a question about history, but it's a different kind of question. One of the things that I think is striking, all historians, no matter what period you're studying, what country or region you're studying, no matter how long ago the past is that you happen to be thinking about and trying to seek to recall or, or to restore or recreate, um, we're always dealing in fragments. Right? That's part of the challenge of being a historian. You never have the full story. You can never have the full truth. You can never know that something actually happened exactly this way at exactly this moment to exactly these kinds of people. And so that search for truth that historians often talk about is always an elusive search. There's never, that destination never arrives, at least it hasn't for me, maybe that's for some other historians. But the, the point with that is that oftentimes the, the, the challenge produces a frustration that we can't actually, we don't have the documentation to be able to piece together the story, to be able to have these voices heard and come alive in their fullest sense. And so the irony, of course, I think, for a, a, a creative artist, a poet, a, a fictional writer, someone who is trying to represent this in its fullest form, that you, perhaps, in your imagination, have greater access to the truth of these lives than a historian might. 
right? So that, that there's lots of different ways that we know about Jamali and that we don't know about Kamali, right? There are oral traditions and sort of mythologies that are passed down that it could have been this, it could have been that. We know more about Jamali, but even his life is fragmented. And then there's all of the debate about who Kamali was. Was Kamali a pseudonym that he wrote under? Was Kamali his wife? Was it his, was his female lover, his sister perhaps, or his male lover? And there are all of these sort of speculations based on fragments or the lack of information that will always be the kind of reality for anyone seeking to represent this. And yet you, as a writer, as a poet, can dig into it matter or open up your imagination and give voice to them in a way that historians will never be able to give voice to them, whether or not. And, and so, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can think of yourself within the sort of creation of history, as not necessarily a historian, but a history maker. Well, um, yes, I can. And what I mean is, well, an odd thing, I mean, a few odd things have happened in this regard, that I ended up on a, a Delhi travel site, and <coughs> they, they, uh, They were telling pe people to ha how, to, how to get to the Jamali Kamali Mosque and Tomb. You take this subway, there's a good Thai restaurant nearby. And as a matter of fact, there's a fascinating story about Jamali and Kamali. And then this website quotes my poem mm -hmm. and says, Jamali and Kamali were lovers. Uh -huh. And Jamali wrote these words to Kamali and wrote <laughs> <to> my book. <laughs> right. so, you know, and, and you can buy it at Google. <laughs> right, you can purchase it here for, for a signature. Right? Yeah, yeah and, then they, and then they say, and if you want to know more of the story, get this book. So, um, you know, when I read that, I, I mean, it made me think a lot about these issues because, because a work of art does actually have an effect. Um, it, you know, it's one of the things that molds how people see things. And it is molding how people are seeing Jamali and Kamali more because it was written down. I think the fact that it was written down is a huge thing that's not just stories that people are telling. Um, but history is just is a mishmash of of the, you know, documents that we have that we can look at that are factual and lies and rumors and art. I mean, I think it all adds up to history. And so history is kind of a funny thing. And memory, right, which is always going to be a perfect flaw. And, yeah. Right. Um, one of the things that struck me about this is that, you know, there are I'm trying to put myself in your head, which I'm, if you'll excuse me for a second, I don't, mean, I don't think I can do that. But look, as, as someone sitting down, you, you've been to the tomb in the mosque, you've visited Delhi, you, you've started to think about writing this poem. And you know that there's debate over who Kamali is, was, could be, etc. And yet you made a choice, right? You could have written a four part poem where one part is. Jamali speaking as Kamali, as a kind of pseudonym, right? Another part is is the sister, another part is the is the wife, and another part is is the lover, the, the male lover. So there, there could have been many many ways that you could have imagined who Jamali was, or who Kamali was, uh, based on what we know about Jamali. And yet you decided, as a as approach for your poem, as the sort of driving force behind it, to seek to represent this tale, as you said, of love and sex and separation and death between. Men. And it's an incredibly tender and powerful and beautiful poem. But you made a choice to focus on the kind of homoerotics and homosexuality of this. And I'm wondering sort of why that choice as opposed to any one of a number of other poetic choices that you could make. Well, I mean, I think that 
It wasn't a choice. Okay. It wasn't a choice, and it wasn't a decision. It, I got back from seeing them that day, and I just started writing as if I was Jamali. There, I didn't know if it would be a poem. I didn't care. It's just the voice was alive in me. You know, there are plenty of people who have read the book say, you were channeling these characters. And, you know, I'm pretty skeptical, so it's hard for me to believe that. But in another way, I feel like, who knows? Because there was no choice. I mean, there was, and there was no time. I mean, I went back and started writing and didn't stop till it was done. Um, you know, it was a choice that I wanted it to be accurate, yeah. you know, as I was working on it. But, um, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, two final questions. One is a question about voice. The, the fourth section of the poem, where we finally get we finally hear from Kamali. The, the poem shifts in, term, in terms of form, content as well, and yeah. voice, but in terms of form, the, the stanzas are shorter, the lines are shorter, the meter is different. Yeah. Um, it's almost as if there's a, a kind of, a, it, it's, there's a kind of succinctness to it, a truncation almost, in the way that you are rendering his voice vis-a-vis -vis Jamali's voice, which is, which is more elaborate. So. Right. And I'm wondering if what was behind that choice. Clearly, there's a sort of formal decision you're making in terms of how to represent that. And um, if you could talk a little bit about that, because it's very noticeable and strange. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, the, these characters are so real to me. Um, he, he just talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he was so different. And he talked different. Yeah. So so I let him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I could try to elaborate, make it more <laughs> elaborate, but it's really that simple, you know. And, and I think I said to you earlier, like, when I was working on it, I kept thinking, when is Kamali going to start to talk, you know, and um, and then when he did, he did, and and that's how he talked. And one last question about the issue and language of sexuality. Uh, you mentioned interest, several interesting things in, in some of your answers to my question. One is that you had befriended these three gay guys before you left. So the, con the immediate context before your departure was this deepening friendship yeah. with these gay men. Then you um, made a, a, you know, you, you, you got there, you saw this, and you, you, you weighed in in this sort of age-old debate about who these people were and what their relationship was. And you, um, you were moved by the notion that they were lovers, that they were gay lovers in particular. Um, and yet we don't have a full account of that, and yet the tombs themselves you read as being, these are two men, clearly, in these, yeah. in these tombs. But I'm wondering, you know, one of the challenges for, for people who are trying to re, um, kind of re recollect or to restore a kind of queer history or queer yeah. past is that the language we have for sexuality in our 21st century world, yeah. and I say we in you know, not unproblematic way, uh, there are lots of different ways that we represent this, but the language of homosexuality was not even invented until the late 19th century. So the, the way that we talk about sexuality, or that we might think of this relationship between Jamali and Kamali, the way that the gay Indian community today has taken to this as, a, as something of a kind of past that they can kind of claim or, or cling to or have as their own in some way, um, seems to me to always be a little bit problematic because we don't, the language we use, and that we make, yeah. we used to make sense of our relationships and our loves and so yeah. forth, is different from the language that they would have had. And so do you feel any tension at all in that, that piece, and sort of writing for a public that exists today that has different language to express, mm -hmm. and of course you're talking not just about the language of sexuality, but literally different languages yeah. uh, across cultures and, and, and contexts? Um.
Well, you know, the choice of words all through it had to do very much with the world I had created. Um, so, so the, the particularly erotic portions are relating to itself um, in, a, in an earlier time. Um, I mean, some people have read it and thought it was a translation of an old text. You know, not that it's um, what am I saying? I guess, I guess the, po the poem dictated the language, not, not an awareness of whether I should be using a certain kind of language or not. It was the poem that did. Yeah, yeah. And I think you do that beautifully. I mean, you don't talk about homosexuality or bisexuality or queer. And you don't impose any of that yeah. on the text itself. The language of this is very much about love and affection and sexuality and sex and all those things, which I think you do quite, quite beautifully, actually. All right, let's uh, open it up for questions and comments. Um, I have questions all night, but yes. And please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Annie Lanzalato. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, I was so there is fragments of Jamali's writing, and some is in the tomb. Is that is that right? Yes. Um, there are two of his verses in Persian that circle the tomb. And that's at the end of the book here. Yeah. There's an appendix. And is that the only writing of his? No, or? no, he wrote poems. I mean, you can read a volume of his poetry. And where does he fit in Sufi literature in terms of Rumi and like where's the the lineage? I don't know. We don't know who his teachers were or anything. Um, I don't know who, who his teachers were. Magnificent, thank you. Yeah. How did you find the, oh, I'm Amy Grauberg, all the um, How did you find the scholar to converse with and get um, your information? Right after I started writing it, I was at Sans Greedy, and like the next day, I had started having questions. So I went to the administration there, and I said, you know, I really have a problem because <laughs> I really need to know some things, and I, like, can you help me out? So they gave me the email of this guy in England who had recently been there and was very interested in the tomb. And that guy got out of here? No, 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 no. So the guy that first just made the homo, the no, no, you missed it, you came out Yeah. Um, and one thing that just, I find really interesting about both Sufi and also Hindu mystical writing of that period is that the erotic is seen also as a double meaning in the poetry of the, the physical relationship and also the human relationship of the divine. Right. And, um, and in a way that's been used actually in more recent times to sort of erase the actual sexual content and to say, oh no, it's all a metaphor because the, the sexuality is about, you know, completely surrendering to God and it's not really so physical. So I think it's really interesting that in your, um, in your book you really restore that erotic side and I'm wondering if you uh, had any sense of also reaching for the divine side or, or bringing in that layer? Well, <coughs> there was a period when I was working on it, when I was reading Jamali's actual poems, and they're so sexual that they're all for to God. You know, so I was reading like, what? I, I just was, you know, it was sort of beyond me. Um, so I was aware of it. Um, and you know, in my, in in this work, there's there's no such thing. Mm -hmm. Questions? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Back there. Hi, Lucia, my an old friend of Karen's. <laughs> um, so I was interested about your last question. I'm sorry. I, your name was Tim McCarthy. Jay. Tim. 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 Yeah. Um, you can call me Jay, though. I was surprised <laughs> about. I, I was surprised about that question, and I wonder, Karen, if you agree or anyone else here that that the language of desire and longing and separation would have been that different. I mean, my... Oh, that's not what I was saying. I was okay. saying that the, the language, how we use homosexual or bisexual... We need to make that differentiation, you Right, saying? right. The, the ideas of, 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 cre of using certain kinds of distinctions to create lines of difference between different manifestations of sexuality or different types of desire, homosexual, heterosexual, etc., is yeah. a very modern language. The language of being attracted to someone, or to yeah. be sexually aroused by someone, or to have desire for the longing, that, that, that wasn't what I was talking about. I was talking about specifically characterizing this as homosexual, yeah. is, a relative, is, is a more modern way of characterizing this than would have been available to these folks at that moment when they were together. That's what I meant. You know, you push back on. Yeah, so you're saying okay. that there would, because I really don't know. There would have been less, sort of almost what I hear you saying is that where we are now is kind of returning to a way that maybe it was, where there was was much more fluid and less differentiate or whatever, less categorizing. Yeah, I actually think I, in practice that is yes, true. Yes. I, actually, I mean, historically, people had yes. sexual relations and longings Long and desires and all across the spectrum. And so, like Walt Whitman, for instance, yes. right? And Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass and all of his poetry is talking about all of the you know, I contain multitudes and he blurs all these different boundaries. And his whole poetic project is to actually dismantle yeah. these binaries and lines of distinction. But yet, Walt Whitman would never have referred to himself as a bisexual or homosexual because those words have not been invented yet, right? So I think that I think you're right in terms of practice. We may actually be returning to ancient times, frankly, yeah, uh, which, okay. and, and perhaps the language will follow that and, mm -hmm. and, and, and blow. I mean, I, I'm hopeful of that. What I'm talking about is that you know, homosexuality as a word literally enters the English language in the last quarter okay. of the 19th century. Okay, okay. That's, that's more what I meant. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Bala. Uh, I'm a student in the Kennedy School. So a couple of questions which I had when, uh, one, as a poet. Uh, classically, you either be an expressionist in that sense of it, and two, you, you, how do you, how did you transcend something like passion? Uh, go back to, go back on time, on passion, and uh, also that's what the question is called, it, to, to look at facts and to look at, am I getting my history and the language right? Uh, at the same time, uh, putting that within you along with you talking to Jamali. I mean, these are, I mean, there's an element of birth and there's an element of organic uh, expressions which going out. At the same time, there is also a, uh, there's an invention of, uh, uh, there's an invention and simulation of history which you're bringing in. How do you do that as a poet? I mean, it's easy to be in either of these realms, uh, but how do you, as a poet, how did you? Well, I work? think um, in stages, in the, meaning the, the passion, the passionate story kind of comes first, and then, you know, and then I'm working on it, and then I start and then I start seeing more of a context um, where it's taking place and what the details of that are. I, I, it doesn't come whole, all at once. And a lot happens in the process of revision. Mm -hmm. Do, does that answer your question? Can, can I say something about, I mean, am I allowed to talk about, we were in touch for some of the time, and I'm Jeff. And he's a poet. Yeah. And um, I mean, she was really immersing herself in the whole culture. I mean, you said you had books all around you, and so I was sort of imagining you sort of immersing yourself in everything until the next burst kind of came for the poem. So, 
So there's a there is a part where she's sort of studying, and then there's a part that's more like inspiration and getting the poem down. That's that's sort of how I, is that accurate? Well, it went on for so long that like that's accurate for a certain time. But then I remember I was talking to my son on the phone who had just gone on a hike in New Mexico, and he said, "Oh my God!" And there were these cliffs, and he started describing them, and I got off the phone and was like. That's going in the poem, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know. So it it can't. In this is what I think it is. I think that when a writer is lucky enough to be in that state where things feel very given, that just about anything you do is usable and it can be a, it, it can it can be a conversation with a friend about some stupid little anything it can be a big fat book about um, you know Delhi in the 16th century and the, and what was going on politically it can be anything when you are in that state, you just synthesize and synthesize what what's around you. Hi, my name is Kupesh, and I'm a student at Business School. I grew up in India. I'm a little curious to understand and know uh, what was the perception of homosexuality in 16th century. And I know you're not an historian, so uh, I understand that. But maybe through your research, if you would have developed a perspective on that, and also if you could differentiate between how it looked in the Hindu kingdom of, say, the Rajputs, versus how it's looked in the Mughal period. Yeah. Um, well, what, um, <coughs> certainly in that time, like, like the rulers who were married and had families had young men that they had sexual relationships with. I mean, I don't think that was unusual. I don't think it was looked down on. I mean, that's what I gather. Um, do you? Yeah. 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 I can just add on to a um, bit of it in this case. Uh, there's a story of Pija and Vita too, in the Rajput uh, folklore of Pija and Vita being two men. Uh, so there, are, there is a history even before the 16th century in Mughal era, uh, but you know, an educated Indian uh, Shiva coming as a you know, female, also appearing as a female god. And I think there were two strands of Islam in the Mughal times. So the Sufi stand of mysticism with, 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 with Timon and Kamali rooted at the sky. Then there's other strand of Islam which is also emerging during that period. That tension was at a, I mean, and, and the Mughal era kind of was, were the two strands kind of started emerging uh, and had its tension. But we also had the Rajput uh, times. We have still folklore of Yeah. I have uh, two parts in my question. What's your name? Uh, Helen. Hi. I actually do um, some China-US art and poetry reading work, and I translate and tutor Chinese language. Um, so my qu first question is, um, what do you see in relations um, of, you say, love is life, life is love, right? Um, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, but on a bigger scale, um, how do you um, connect imagination, creativity, and love? That's a mighty big question. Well, certainly in writing this book, letting the imagination flower made it possible to encompass seeing love in various forms. And 
and aspects of love and pain. And, uh, so, and then that will um, expand more creativity on your um, definition of love and imagination. And Did you have a second? Oh, yeah, the yeah. second question is um, you mentioned about um, on the um, people here as uh, you work as a poet in residence at a psychiatric hospital. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? <laughs> Um, for 13 years, I worked at a psychiatric hospital on a ward um, with mostly schizophrenic people. And I was there writing poems with them. I wasn't there as a therapist. And actually, this man here was a psychiatrist on the ward. Yes. A long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. Mm. It was really amazing work. It was fascinating, and some of the patients wrote really beautiful things. Yeah, because I um, was reading an article in a book um, about how uh, poets sometimes think um, holistically in a chaotic environment. Um, and that order in the chaos, you know, it's hard to be identified by people who, you know, may not feel how they feel. So I was wondering what you know, you think about the, the chaos and the order and the creativity that come out of that chaos. Um, well, I think for, for a lot of the patients there, that being able to use their, the chaos of their mind to make something constructive and work on it, like a poem, was, um, was very welcome. Does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm fascinated by two different processes. One is, you know, who how do you, who has the right to know certain things, right? So as I, I write memoir, and even just re, re-remembering and going back and piecing together history, as you said. The second thing I'm fascinated, I'm a lesbian, and I'm an Italian, and all of Italy is fascinated with the Pope's manservant. <laughs> this guy they call Bello Giorgio. And, and um, you know, for, Modern history, gays and lesbians have been called sister, friend, you see in this book, uh, could be his pen name, could be a sister, could be a, a house worker, could be, you know. And the same thing is going on now with Bello Giorgio. Who is this man who puts on the Pope's ermine vests and puts on his red Prada shoes? And in the, in the gay community, it's just assumed that they're both closeted queens yeah. and that the Vatican is the biggest, most flamboyant, casual type, you know, <laughs> sexual underground in the world. And not that, the, not that it's said that anyone knows anything about the Pope's uh, private life or, or anything. It's Studio 54 without the drugs. You know, and... Um, <laughs> You know, I'd love to see this even, it's so vivid, uh, your writing, I'd love to, it reminds me of uh, Brokeback Mountain, like this, you know, only it's Kamali, J Jamali, and, and who buried them? Who paid for these graves? Like, who, who had the power to say these two will be buried together? I think, can I add to that? Because I have a Please. question about that too, I, which strikes me is that, that, you know, we've been talking a lot about the imaginative process, right, of, of, of to kind of cre trying to imagine the voices and to create this love affair and so forth. And yet, what inspired this in you was actually physically going to this space, this tomb and mosque, where there are these gravestones which you, which can be read in a particular way that actually inspire along with that, the whoever it was that brought you there saying that they were homosexual lovers. That was what inspired the kind of imaginative journey which then you know, resulted in the book. But it was the physical, it was the being in that space 
And I'm interested, like, how was that space created? Was this, was this a routine thing? Did all court poets get to, you know, or was it because he was a, 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 a battle warrior? Or, I mean, why, is it, why was Kamali in, buried there? In fact, um, it was really unusual. Right, that's my it, sense. It was really yeah. unusual, though not unheard of, okay. to build, uh, you know, a, a, a tomb for someone who was alive. But it's also thought that perhaps it was built for Jamali by, I think, who I mean by one of the rulers, as a dervish cell. And then it was turned into a tomb later. So nobody really knows, but... Um, a place of quarters. Like a home or a residence. Right. Uh, just a little, a very bare little An ascetic. The monastery. Right. Yeah, the monastery. No, no, no. No. Then it would have been turned into a two layer. So it may not initially have been built to serve the function of a two layer yeah, mosque, yeah. but that was more of a. You have a question? You've probably asked all the questions you need to know about this, right? You lived through it, yeah. Other questions or comments? I have one. I have endless questions, so I, I'll, I'll just, when people don't raise their hand, I'll just pop in. Uh, I wanted to, to have you talk just a little bit about the reception this has gotten. You mentioned the, the gay community in India, and that they've really taken to this, and that this is something that, that they um, embrace which I can understand, but I, I wonder if you could sort of talk a little bit about that. I, 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 you, know, the, the, you know, I don't know tons about the gay community in India. Yeah. So what is, what is it about this book and what is it about the community and what have been your experiences with that community? Um, it's all been long distance because yeah. I've been back here, but um, I've just been approached by numerous gay magazines and bloggers you know, to be interviewed or answer questions about it, this or that. Um, a really interesting thing happened that a, an Indian graphic artist wrote to me and said that he wanted to make a, a pretty well-known graphic artist, that he wanted to make a graphic novel out of the book. And, and um, I thought that was a pretty fantastic idea. I mean, I hadn't read any yeah. graphic novels, and then I just like read a lot of them, and they're I thought, great. oh, yeah, yeah. they're so great, yeah. they're gone. <laughs> so, um, and I got permission from the publisher to, that he could do it. And then he went back to his publisher, to, who originally said they would do it, and they said, no, we, it, it would cause community violence. Mm -hmm. Wow. So okay. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't touch it. So that was, it was disappointing, but also really interesting. That, Is this an Indian publisher? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, what occurred to me is that I guess they thought graphic novels would get to a very different, a, broader audience. a much broader mm -hmm. audience of younger, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if any of you know a graphic novel here, so I'm just hoping that it was, would be graphic, the images. Well, one in the graphic novel, and it would be, I mean, it could just be that it's one thing to write it, but it's another to have the images same. of yeah. it. Yeah. And it's something so taboo as that. Yeah. Other questions? No, we're good. We're good. Okay. All right, good. All right, do you have any closing remarks you want to you <laughs> offer? Um, thanks for coming. <laughs> All right. Karen, thank you very much for yeah. being here.